mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your great compassion, blood of my many transgressions, and wash away. Let's sing this together. guest here. Um, my name is Jonathan, and I am the preacher here. One of my favorite things I get to do, um, this may sound morbid, but it's not, is I get to do funerals. And I love it. I love doing funerals. A um, hundred times I've sat with people who are saying goodbye and weeping and grieving, and there's always this kind of bittersweet ache that comes with it. Um, I think about the memories that we have with the people that we love that are no longer with us. And I don't know if this is part of being a preacher's kid, but sometimes at the dinner table, my kids will bring up those stories. You know, like Randy Hughes kissed Bill Clinton when he was wearing a dress. <laughs> and there's a picture of this. Tom Gardner... Uh, Passed away a couple of years ago, wonderful godly man, has a lot of pictures of him in dresses, dressing in the same dress that Linda Smith did. There's Miss Linda. With Linda Smith, looking unhappy about her um, fashion choices for the day. I think about Eleanor Walls, who just recently passed, and her sweet spirit and her hunger for God. I think about Miss Marilyn Boyle who was a faithful and tireless servant at River City Ministry. And um, I think about all the people that I've got to be in the hospital room as their bodies were wearing out, as my body will one day wear out, as your body will one day wear out. And at a Christian funeral, there are a lot of tears, and there's also something else. There's tears of joy and sorrow. And I'm bringing those people up not because I want to just keep their memory alive. I believe they are alive, more alive than ever, but because it helps me know how to be fully alive, how to live. And they help teach us 
Their lives help teach us. So around the world today is a day that is known. It's on your holiday. If you're an Apple user or whatever Outlook, it, it shows up. It's Ash Wednesday. And what that means is that people all over the world, the majority of the population are at least familiar with it in the world, that today is a day where people have ashes put on their heads and it's told, them, told to them, from dust you came and to dust you will return. So I grew up in Churches of Christ, and the first time I'd ever heard of Ash Wednesday, or really done Ash Wednesday, I was told I had to preach Ash Wednesday. And so I am sitting at my office at a Tuesday, Googling Ash Wednesday, Wikipedia, all those kind of things. And today, I can't imagine not observing this, but I remember thinking, like, what a bleak ritual are we doing? Now... Here's the thing about Ash Wednesday. It's profoundly biblical, although you don't have to call it that, but it starts off with Genesis. When Adam and Eve sin, and what is human history but rebellion against God, Adam and Eve sins and God tells them, you know what? From dust you were made and to dust you will return. It is a pronouncement of what happens when human beings are living in prideful rebellion. So soon after that, in Genesis, there's a lot of stories about human beings trying to, you know, get the edge on each other. And there's a story of this guy named Abraham. God calls Abraham because he's going to show him how to live a different kind of way. And at one point, Abraham is living in a settlement of a city called Sodom and Gomorrah. And God is going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of its evilness. And Abraham talks to God, he negotiates with God on how to save the city, and when he does it, he says, I, Lord, if I can be so bold, I am nothing but dust and ashes. Do you know the word humility comes from the word hummus, which is a word that means dirt? It's the word that means dirt. And humility is to recognize that we are mortal, that we will one day die, and that changes the way we approach each other. So change, it changes the way we look at our life. It changes the way we think about our jobs, our families, and how we have a relationship with God. And here's the reason I think days like today are important. Because we live in a world where we talk about things that would make our ancestors blush. Right? There's no, nothing is taboo. Except this. Death. We don't talk about death. Um, All throughout human history, every society has had ways of talking about death and dealing with death, except for a secular society. Um, Traditional um, societies, um, uh, religious societies all throughout human history have had a way to um, talk about the hardships that come with grief. But in our society, it's hard. We pretend like that doesn't happen. We, we put people who are sick or dying out of sight. We put our cemeteries out of sight. So we don't have to deal with it. So Western societies, from sociologists say that we are some of the... Sociologists say Western societies are some of the worst for preparing people for death. And if you don't get Ash Wednesday, you're not alone. So in order to understand Ash Wednesday, I want to tell you a little bit about Lent. And if you don't do... Lent, that's totally fine, but a couple of words about this. Because in Churches of Christ, which is what I grew up in, um, one of our great strengths is that something was in the Bible, we were going to do it. If Jesus did it, if the early Christians did it in the New Testament, we were going to do it. And Lent and Ash Wednesday aren't in the New Testament. In fact, what is in the New Testament is that there can be a danger in celebrating some holy days over uh, other holy days. Um, but here's what I want you to see or explain why I think this is something for you to consider doing. When I was a freshman in college, a kid that was my age left Church of Christ and went to become Greek Orthodox. And that was the first time that happened. I thought, that's really odd. And then I went and worked at a church in Fort Worth as a college minister, and I saw these two things happen. There was an influx of people who were leaving churches of Christ and also Baptist and other kind of low church, free church um, groups of Christians. And they were going to Lutheran and um, Catholic and, and fellowships like that. And then at the same time this was happening, 
there was also an influx of people coming from Catholic churches to our church and Lutheran churches to our church. And when we asked why, here's what we found out. The people that grew up in our fellowship were saying, yeah, we know the Bible, but we would like to experience God. And the people that were coming from the other fellowships were saying, yeah, we know the rituals, but we don't really know what they mean. We'd like to know what the Bible says about this stuff. So here's the best way I know how to help. Turn to Leviticus. Actually, you don't have to turn to Leviticus, but you might sometime. It, Leviticus is in between all the stories about how to kill goats and spread the blood and all those things. In Leviticus 23, there is a really powerful idea because it's all the Jewish festivals that God gives them. Festivals that Jesus would have kept. Festivals that he keeps in the Gospels. Festivals of him. Uh, and and what, what is happening behind this is this idea that your time matters. So God gives Israel, his people, a, ta- a calendar, a cadence. In the Bible, over a thousand different times, it talks about our time. And I don't think most Americans have a view of time as sacred, or at least we don't think we do. Do you know when the majority of mas- vasectomies are, uh, the appointments are made for the majority of vasectomies in America? When? Why? March Madness. The majority of vasectomies are made in America around March Madness, um, and which, by the way, I think is brilliant and telling. Um, the danger of not paying attention to what your calendar is and isn't telling you is that it does work in your life. It shapes you in your life. So you orient your life around April 15th or July 4th or Super Bowl Sunday or, you know, the beginning of, you know, pitchers and catchers reporting to spring training. Um, We get our word holiday from the word, does anybody know? Holy day. That's right. There are certain days and seasons that are different than others, right? And here's why I think you already know that. When do Christians around the world worship? What day? Sunday. You already have a Christian calendar. In fact, this is one of the best evidence that God raised Jesus from the dead. Thousands of people overnight stopped worshiping God primarily on a Saturday and started worshiping him on a Sunday. You already have a Christian calendar. What year is it? Come on, 2023, that's right, 2023 years since Jesus was born. So let me be careful on this because the New Testament is pretty careful on this. When Paul is writing to churches trying to get Jewish people who have had a sacred calendar together for thousands of years, when he's trying to get them together with the Gentiles, Paul says something really significant. Because while this is meaningful to me, it may not be meaningful to you. And Paul knows the human heart well enough to know that if I find a way that this shapes me in the image of Jesus, and I look to my left and I see that you don't, you know what I can do? Just feel a little bit better about myself because I'm a little bit more spiritual than you. And that's actually what Paul is getting at in Romans 14 and Colossians 2. This is not a means for salvation at all. It is a means of orienting your life around the story of Jesus. So God gives the Israelites a calendar because he wants them to remember the exodus, right? So Passover, these moments that are really key in God saving them and and delivering them. And Christians, a couple hundred years after Jesus was raised from the dead, they started thinking, that's something that would be helpful for us to arrange our life around. And since Passover was something that was, you know, every year, they were able to realize that 40 days before Passover was a good time to do what Jesus did in his own life, which was fast for 40 days. And that's what they call Lent. Now, you don't have to call it Lent. If that sounds too like uh, other groups of Christians do that to you, you can call it springtime. Because guess what Lent means in Latin? Springtime. That's what it is. 
It's just the 40 days before Passover time when Jesus was killed. So for over a thousand years, before Catholics and Protestants split, Christians have entered into the season and asked hard questions about themselves. You've, you've noticed the songs that we sang tonight were songs that were scripture set to music of the people, the men and women who have gone before us, the brothers and sisters of God who have gone before us, who were faithful enough to answer the hard questions and look in the mirror. Now, if you are a disciple of Jesus, this is a non-negotiable. One of the things that's overlooked often in Christianity is how Jesus kept pushing his disciples to becoming self-aware, not self-focused, not self-centered, but self-aware. So Jesus will tell in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, before you judge someone, take the out of your own eye, and then you can help your brother or sister with the speck in their eye. The Gospel of Matthew is really strong on this. When Jesus says, it would be better for someone to have a milestone tied around their neck and then thrown into the sea than for them to cause a little one to stumble. When he tells the story of the parable, he's trying to get you to think, what kind of condition is my heart and soul in? How am I how am I interacting with other people? Not that everybody else is always the problem. Not that it's the politician's fault. Not that the world in general is broken, which of course it is. But where is that brokenness that is so easy for me to see in every single person I encounter? Where is it hiding in me? One of the things that was challenging for me is I realized I had a theology of sin that was pretty shallow. And that meant basically I judged sin by what I, you know, if I didn't smoke or I didn't use those words or I didn't listen to that music or watch that music or watch that movie or whatever. But sin is not just a behavior, it's a nature. It's even got my imagination. It's even got my mind that it's, it's in my will and so here's how it plays out for me, and see if this rings true to you. I read the Bible, and there's some stuff that's disturbing to me, but it, that's not for me. The stuff that I really gravitate toward is the stuff that should be disturbing to you. Does anybody else know what I'm talking about here? Am I the only one? And so what happens when churches do this is we judge other people who do the same things we do, but with different parts of the Bible, and we feel superior and smug and self-righteous, and we split and split and split, all while we feel like if those sinners over there at that church could just get on board with my way of understanding the Bible, then we could really get on with this project of unity. What is that? It's sin. It's pride. It's not an honest admission of the way things are, the way I am. So when I was growing up, my best friend, Bub, his dad, Mr. Al, told me something one time, and it's changed my life. I didn't like it at the time, but it changed my life, and it changed the way less than I parent. He said in a moment of pride, he said, Jonathan, you should apologize to that person. And I didn't want to apologize. And he said, the thing that keeps you from apologizing is pride. And in life, you either kill pride or pride kills you. Up until that point, I had not thought much about pride. I mean, I'm a teenager. I had plenty of it, but I hadn't thought of it. But I respected Mr. Al, and I really wanted to be like him. And so <laughs> you, can, you can ask my mom and dad about this because it was awful. But there was a time in my life when I had to start going to my mom and dad, who are the last person you want to do this to when you're a teenager, and saying, hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for how I talked to you. I'm sorry for what I did there. And the strangest thing began to happen. There was a sense of dread that starts to come over me. And I began to recognize what that sense was for what it is. It was also the same feeling I had when a girl rejected me which doesn't probably take a lot of imagination for you to realize I was very familiar with that feeling. It was the same feeling I got when our team lost a game or when I was around people who were smarter than me or better dressed than me because they had some money 
or who were better at pretending like they were religious than me. And I started noticing what I would do to get that feeling to stop. I'd do a lot. And I started to realize Mr. Al was right. Either I was going to have to kill that or it was going to kill me. I cannot emphasize how important this is. In the Christian faith, this is the whole ball of wax. This is important for what kind of person you are becoming, what kind of soul you give back to God, and what kind of life you live. And tonight, people all over the world are coming together and reminding ourselves, from dust you came, and to dust you will return. Now, in a traditional Ash Wednesday service, at some point, you would come forward and some people would put ashes on your forehead and they would say that sentence to you. But we're not doing that tonight. Instead, here's an idea. It's a jar of dirt. If it's not going to be on your head, maybe it could be on your mantle for the next few days. Because we came from this. And we're going to return to this. And one day, you're not going to be any better dirt than anybody else. Now, God is going to raise us from the dead if the Christian faith is going to be believed. But God, we are not God. We are created, not creators. And in those moments where you're the most important person in the room, when you're the boss of someone else, when you can say jump and they say how high. When you're the leader that everyone looks to, when you walk in and you're the smartest person in the room or the most powerful person in the room or the wealthiest person in the room or when you've traveled more than those people have, when pride begins to get an inch of territory in your heart, would you just do this? Would you remind yourself in that moment where you're, you're tempted to be like, well, it's about time. Would you just remind yourself you're going to die. We're going to die. And, and when you start to feel insecure because you're around somebody who's got more power or money or better dressed or they've traveled more or they have more education than you, would you in that moment remember that God has given all of this? And that's why our pride is a lie. So one of the hardest things about living in a secular culture that pretends like we don't die is that it's really hard to grieve and I've found that people don't so much struggle with grief as they struggle with all the energy that it takes to avoid grief and death is not good it's the last enemy to be defeated it's not good or noble but Jesus was our pioneer in this regard and that's why what we did tonight as we walk through these different stories in the gospels and we showed our kids and our own souls that this really did happen this is unlike any other world religion it is not one among many world religions this is a this is christianity stands alone and that god became one of us and died like this and that this is the kind of god we have and this god does not avoid suffering he goes into it. And one of the earliest Christians who was very resistant to being a Christian, Saul, who becomes Paul, when Jesus meets him after he had been raised from the dead and, and Saul is on his way to kill other Christians, Jesus' phrase to me is so helpful for going through hard times. Because he says to Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He's going to kill other Christians. And Jesus is letting Saul know why I, I'm sharing in their hard times. And so for the rest of his life, Paul goes around suffering. He goes through the hard things. It changed not just what Paul believed, but how Paul lived and ultimately died. And at one point, Paul is writing back to one of the churches that he planted. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he says this in verse 3. We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves 
in every way, in great endurances, in troubles and hardships and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments, in riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, in purity, understanding, patience, the power of God, the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, Sorrowful and yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. This is how a dying man lives. And if you pay attention, it's a little jarring. It's like two symbols that keep coming together. Sorrow, rejoicing, dying yet alive. And sorrow. Paul knows what comes after sorrow. And he knows that makes it worth being able to enter into it. There's a time in the letter to the Hebrews where the author says, you know what Jesus did? Jesus came to set us free from the slavery that is the fear of death. So we don't have to face death like other people. Death wasn't created by God. God did not make it. God will one day defeat it. So we're free from fearing it. The great irony of nights like tonight is we want to be like God. That's what human rebellion is from Genesis on. But did you notice the stories that we looked around? God is like this. God is not the ego monster that we thought God is like Jesus and this night is a humbling discipline this season is a humbling discipline to start with because human history is a story of people who spend our lives in revolt to God steeped in pride we want to be like God but it's here we're reminded God is not like that so who can be proud when heaven is humble who can Who can stand straight when love himself stoops? God dies. He died. So will we. Take heart, have joy, find humility, because from dust we came, and to dust we will return. So Mr. Al, who told me that, about you got to apologize, who changed the trajectory of my life, Two months ago, we did his funeral. And this guy had been practicing for decades to see the face of God. He had been practicing by letting go of pride. And that's what this night is about. So, Traditionally in the Bible, when people let go of pride, they confess, they repent, they stop making it all about them. And the ways that that you can do that for the next 40 days is to fast from something, something that can loosen the grip that greed has on your soul, the things that this world has on your soul. Serve others to practice humility. Give. Help to be generous in other ways. Because there's no way to become aware of how much you might be in the bondage of something as just trying to resist it for a few moments. Because this is who God is. And we're called to try to become like Him as we follow Him. Let me pray and then... Um, well, you can go out quietly if possible. Father, thank you for the men and women here. I pray that you would bless us as we submit to you and that you would give us the wisdom to be your people. Father, would you help us to have awareness of ways that pride has started to take over our own heart and soul? And would you help us to be Um, acutely aware of both our own death and the life that is to come.
Father, a lot of, there's a lot of grief in everyone's life, from people that we've lost to the situation in the world right now to the tragedy that happened in our city today. I pray that you would bless us as people of peace who can grieve and also grieve with hope. Can we be the kind of people that Paul was? Sorrowful yet rejoicing, having nothing yet having everything. And can we sense in the moments of hard times that when we suffer, you do too with us, that you are with us. And may we sense your presence and may we prepare our hearts for the next few weeks to be people of the cross and resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go in peace.